Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at a data set of stars. Um, so we have six different types of stars, um, and they all take on a various uh, different, for example, different colors, different luminosity values, and um, magnitudes as well. So we have a bunch of those features here, uh, and along with a star type. Um, and then we have the spectral class as well. Uh, so we could um, we could we could probably uh, predict a few different columns here if we wanted, but I think this is the one they want us to predict, which is the type of star. Um, and uh, uh, so yeah, let's get into the notebook. Um, I'm going to use um, both test set validation and k-fold uh, evaluation. Uh, sorry, test set. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're both forms of validation or evaluation of a model. Um, just the thing is, uh, when you're dealing with a small data set, uh, using a test set can sometimes be uh, detrimental because you have fewer training examples to use. Uh, uh, you, you sort of sacrifice training examples at the expense of getting a good read of how your model's doing. So k-fold is one way to address that problem. And we will be in importing kfold along with the train test split function from sklearn.model selection. Uh, in addition, I will be importing NumPy and Pandas for working with the data, and then uh, the standard scalar from sklearn for pre processing. Uh, and then we'll use just a logistic regression model, uh, nothing fancy today. Also, turning up warnings, let's just go ahead and import the data using uh, pandas.readcsv. We can get the file path up here. So we'll copy that, paste it in, uh, and we can take a look. So here's the data set. Uh, we only have 240 rows. So like I said, um, if we were to take 30% of this for a test set, then we would really be uh, training with a very small number of examples. Now 240 is already small, but there, but kfold is one way to get around this problem, and I'll show you how it works. Um, so let's start by pre-processing. First thing I want to do is get a little information on the data set. Uh, we can see we have no missing values in the whole data set. Uh, we also have two object columns, which is the star color and spectral class columns. So we're going to have to employ some uh, one-hot encoding for that one. So let's start pre-processing. Um, I'm going to create, uh, I guess we can create the one-hot encode function first, because we know we're going to need it. Um, and for one hot encoding, uh, we're going to pass in a data frame, uh, a column we'd like to encode, and a prefix to go along with, with the uh, encoding. So uh, first thing I want to do is create a copy of the data frame. And then we're going to use this function uh, it's from pandas called get dummies. And get dummies will take in a column. Uh, let's say we want to use the star color column. We'll pass it in, and we'll get the, uh, sorry, not df here, it's actually data. Um, we'll get uh, back um, each value, each unique value goes to its own new column. And actually, I'm noticing something about this. Uh, we have sort of overlapping colors. Um, they're written differently, so we're actually getting different values. So we actually should go in here and fix this up. So what I'm going to do is create a mapping called color mapping. Um, it's going to be a dictionary that's going to map each one of these names to the name we want to give it. So, for example, blue uh, is going to blue, obviously. Um, then blue also, we have to figure out what's the difference here. So we can go into data sub star color dot unique to see what's going on. Um, and usually this is a problem with white space. Yeah, you can see there's one with white space at the end. So let's map that one also to blue. Uh, then we have blue-white, which is good. We'll leave that. Um, so actually, we only have to really address the, the, the problematic ones. So the blue with the white space is going. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, there are four blue, no, five blue-whites. Um, so uh, we, we could just pick one and use it as the convention. I'll use this capital B, capital W with a space in between. Um, so what is going to map to blue-white? Uh, well, how, how many are there? There's 
one, two, three, four, five. So I'm going to make four of these. And then we want to find the uh, problematic values in here. So we have this one with a lowercase w. So I'm mapping that to blue white with a capital W. We have this one with a hyphen. So I'm going to map that to capital uh, W as well. Uh, and I think the last one is this one here with a hyphen, but both are capital. Oh wait, is there one more in here? Uh, there should be one more here. Oh, with it with a uh, white space at the end. Here it is. So actually, I'll just I'll paste. I want to keep them nice and organized. All right, so here we go. Uh, here's the mapping for the blue whites. Let's see the other ones. Orange is good. Orange red is good. Pale yellow orange is good. These are all unique colors. White. Uh, yep, good. White yellow, whitish, yellowish, yellowish white. I wonder if white yellow and yellowish white are the same. Oh man, this this is this is badly badly encoded, right? Um, so let's figure it out. I mean, it we just have to sort of uh, do our best here. I'm gonna do the I'm gonna change white lowercase to white capital. I'll do that up here. White is gonna become white with a capital. Uh, what else? Yellow white. It's going to be, yeah, let's say this the same as white yellow. I'll call all of the white yellows yellowish white. So there's two of them we have to change here. And they're both being mapped to yellowish white. So comma, got that, next line. And then uh, this one is going to become yellowish white. Uh, and there's one more here, white yellow. It's going to become yellowish white as well. Okay, is there anything else here? Whitish. What does whitish mean? That's that's hard to say. <laughs> yeah, it could just mean white. It could mean yellowish white. I'll leave it as whitish because it's sort of its own thing. All right, but now let's actually do this. Let's let's use this mapping to um, change change the uh, column. So I'll actually do this in uh, a new function called preprocess inputs. Um, that's going to take in just a data frame, going to make a copy of the data frame, and then return the data frame. So this allows us to do all our preprocessing on a fresh copy so that we're mo not modifying the original data in place. Um, so let's grab this color mapping. And we're going to actually, yeah, I'll just grab these, indent over one, and then we're going to replace uh, the color star value, uh, color star color column, with the mapping in here, and pandas has a great function for that. Uh, replace is so basically we just take star color, call dot replace on it, and passing the dictionary, and it will perform the mapping for us, and we'll make that the new column. Okay, so now if I return this, uh, let's call it x. X will be the processed version of the uh, data. So we're passing in data, getting back x, and currently um, x should be the same as um, as data. The only difference here is that uh, we've changed, we've done this mapping to the star color column. So let's uh, let's go and look at that. So here um, here are our dummies for the for data. Now let's see if if it's different for x. All right, and that's much better. You can see that we now only have a certain number of unique values. Oh, well, actually, we missed one, which is yellowish. Uh, this is with the lowercase. Um, let's just make sure. Okay, no, no white space there. So over here, we're going to map yellowish to capital yellowish. All right. Oh, I need a comma. Okay, so now if we look, we now have. Oh no, what happened? What? <laughs> no, we missed one or something. I don't see what the problem is. This one needs to be mapped. So we're going to put it in here. That's the same. Why is this one not being changed? Is there another yellowish in there? <laughs> oh, 
Oh, we didn't actually run it. I'm sorry. That's so. That's not. We we forgot to actually apply the transformation. Okay, there we go. It's gone. All right. So now we have a bunch of unique colors, um, and each uh, each example now has a call a, a vector, a one hot vector associated with um, the example, where a one represents the original value of that column. So this is a way of cat of uh, encoding categorical variables. Uh, uh, when the values within the variable do not ta uh, take some sort of ordering. Okay, so let's actually use this in our one hot function now. So I'm going to create the dummies using pandas.getDummies, this time for a general d uh, general column that we specify in the function parameters. We'll also include a prefix. And the prefix here, uh, it's very simple. It just, we're going to put uh, color and then you can see that it just adds color to the beginning so that we know where these values originally came from. So we're, we're going to specify any general prefix here. So prefix equals prefix. Um, then when we're done, we're going to take the dummies and put them onto the original data frame uh, using pandas.concat. So we're concatenating the original data frame and the new dummies columns side by side, so axis one. Uh, and then when we're done with that, we can drop the original column from which we created the dummies and return the df. Uh, and that should be it. That looks like a one hot encode function. So let's try using that in here. After we've performed this mapping, say uh, fix color values, uh, then we're going to one hot encode. And so I'm going to use the one hot encode function, uh, which takes in a data frame, a column, and a prefix, and returns a data frame. So I'm going to overwrite df here with one hot encode, and we're going to pass in df. Our column is going to be, uh, let's take a look at data again. So we want to one hot encode the star color and spectral class columns. So let's do it with star color. So star color, uh, and the prefix we can give it will just be color. Make these double quotes. Okay, and then this one uh, is spectral class, so we just put that in there, and then uh, the prefix we can give it here. Uh, this could be anything. I guess we could just do class. All right, and now here's our data. Uh, we have the original um, columns here, and now we also have the one hot columns on the side. Uh, these are the one hot columns for both the colors and the classes. And you see they each get each unique value gets its own column and we can now proceed. And we can't actually see all the columns here, but it's okay, you get the idea of what's going on. Alright, so um, I guess what's next is to split and scale the data. So there's not really anything left to do with this data set. Uh, it's fully in numeric form. We know there's no missing values. The last thing we can do is scale the data, but before we do that, I'd like to split it. So let's split df into x and y. Y is going to be the column we're trying to predict. So it's df sub uh, star type. This is the this is the column we're trying to predict here. And then x is going to be all the rest of the data. So we're going to drop star type uh, from the data frame and store that uh, store the rest of the data in x. All right, and now uh, we can return x and y instead of just x. And you can see that x uh, no longer has the star type column and that has now been stored in Y. And we can go even further and do a train test split. Uh, and this is where we split 70% of the data into the train set and the other 30% into the test set. For this, we can use the train test split function from sklearn, pass in X and Y, specify a train size of 70% or whatever we like. I'm gonna turn on uh, shuffle equals true. This is on by default actually, but it just, uh, it'll shuffle the data before, um, before we uh, make the split. And because we're doing a random shuffle, I'd like to include a random state that will ensure the shuffle always happens in the same way. Uh, and that will return four new sets of the data, x train, x test, y train, and y test. Uh, and then let's return these four sets instead of just x and y. And we'll get them back over here, and we'll take a look at x train. And here's x train, so it's only 70% of the data now. You can see um, that is not a lot of data. Uh, so, 
All right. Um, let's see. Right now, all of the means and variances of the different columns are all over the place. So the, the range of values uh, and the uh, means of each column are are uh, very different, widely distributed. So if we look at that, we can actually call dot describe to see this. Uh, we can see the mean of each column. They're all over the place. This one has a mean of zero. Uh, this one is all the way up to 10, 102,000, so very different. And then standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. Uh, you can see uh, they are also uh, very different. So we'd like to standardize the columns so that they all have the same mean and variance, or at least that's one way of doing it. For that, we'll use a standard scalar. Uh, so we're going to create that with the standard scalar from sklearn. And we're going to fit the scalar to the train set, uh, just the train set, because we want to sort of assume we don't have access to the test set. Uh, and then we will also transform the train set uh, whoops, and the test set. So we're, we're tr going to transform both train and test based on the fit we have just the train. And so we'll, we'll call those, uh, the top will be x train and this one will be x test. So if we run this now, uh, it has been scaled. However, we can no longer view it as a nice data frame. So I'm going to turn them back into data frames after using pandas.dataframe. And I'd like to keep the indices the same as they were before. So index equals x train dot index. The bottom will be x test. And the column names I'd like to keep the same. Uh, so for the columns, we'll have x train dot columns and the bottom will be x test. So let me go change this x test and x test. So we're just keeping the same indices and columns as we had before. And now you'll see uh, it looks just like it did before with the right indices and columns, uh, but the uh, values have been scaled so that we now have means all across the board very close to zero and the standard deviations are all extremely close to one. So uh, we are ready uh, and the reason we do this is it actually improves the performance of many models and it's just good practice uh, to do unless there's a reason, a specific reason you wouldn't want to do it. Okay so let's, uh, let's see Y train. Y train should just be 70% of the label values so fair enough, it's star type, but only using 70% of it. And now let's try training. So the first way we'll do this is with test set evaluation. So this is the standard way of, of uh, evaluating a model. You split your data into train set and test set. You train the model on the train set and you evaluate on the test set. And so this is usually a good idea. I mean, I, uh, there's it's very simple easy to use. I'm going to create a simple log uh, logistic regression model and fit it to the train set, x train, y train, and then we'll print out the results, which will be the, so this is the test set accuracy that we're seeing here. Um, and we can get that. Um, so I'm going to format it with two decimal places and a percent sign since it is an accuracy value. And we can get that with the model.score function. Uh, if we're using a classification um, classifier from sklearn, uh, then the score function will return the accuracy on the test set. So we're passing the test set here, and since we are doing a percentage, I'm going to multiply it by 100. And we can see a value of how well our model is doing. So um, this is good. I mean, it's nice It's nice to see this, but there's sort of a few issues with this. Um, I wouldn't say they're like terrible issues. There's, it's not really that bad, but uh, for one thing, we're only getting a sense of evaluation on a subset of the data. And there's no guarantee that that subset is going to be an accurate uh, representation of the full data set, especially when you have a small amount of examples. So when, you, when you're dealing with a small number of M or, or a small number of, train, uh, of training examples, the test set, uh, train test split is not actually your best move usually. Now I still do it all the time. It's really not that big of a deal. But if you are, um, if you if you are looking for a better way to do it, we can actually use k-fold uh, evaluation. So I'll get into that in just a moment. I just like to point out also that if you are doing a train test split, you're actually reducing the size of your train of your train set um, at the expense of getting a probably a more accurate view, uh, idea of how your model is doing. 
So this this is highly accurate, assuming that the test set is um, representative of what kind of uh, data you'd like to you'd see in the future. Um, but now we'll move on to kfold uh, evaluation, which addresses some of these problems by essentially uh, splitting the data set into a number of folds or a number of splits. And usually this, this is like five or 10. It, it, um, I believe uh, as you increase the number of splits, the uh, effectiveness of this technique goes up uh, because you're getting a more general sense of the performance of your model. But basically you, you divide your, your training set into what we'll say five splits. And then you take each split as a test set and you train a model on the rest of the data uh, and then you do it for the next one. You take the second split as the test set and you train the model on the rest of the data. And so we can end up with, with five different accuracy values that may, either, any one of them may not be as accurate or as, uh, as informative as this value. Uh, but the good thing about it is you're not, um, this is also really good if you don't have access to a test set uh, because it, you, you don't lose training data in the process because after it's all done, you, st you can still just assume your training data is doing well and not like uh, take 30% out of it. So um, let me show you how to do this. So for this, we're gonna use the kfold, uh, kfold class from uh, sklearn and I'm gonna call it kf. And so here, in here, we're going to specify the number of splits we're going to use. So I'm going to use five splits. Uh, and I'd like to first, I'd just like to sort of um, preview what this looks like. So I'm going to print out the split indices, or uh, the index for each uh, example in each split. And then for i, okay, so the way it works is uh, if we call kf.split. Here, let me, let me just print this. And then we say kf.split and we're going to split x train. Uh, then it pr produces a generator object, which we can then uh, increment through, uh, iterate through using uh, train index and test index. These can be any variable names, but I'm just, um, I'm just doing it like this. So I'm going to call the train indices train index and the test indices test index, and I'm going to increment through this, I mean, iterate through this, and I'm going to print out the train indices only. Actually, we'll do the test. We'll print out the test indices. And so it's showing for each split, this is the indices of our test set. Uh, and so it's a pretty simple, uh, th this part of it is pretty simple. Basically what it does is it just counts up how many values you have and splits that, splits that into five different sections. So it's nice to do that for us. Uh, I'm gonna put that up here. Uh, and I, what I'm also going to do is enumerate this so I can get in, in like a a proper numeric indexer as well, I'll call it i, and I'll store these in a tuple and say an enumerate like this. So this way we can print out i, uh, which is the number of split, as well as the test indices or train indices. So we're gonna print out the number of split first. I'll make this just an f string uh, with a new line, split, uh, split i, well, I'll do i plus one since we want to start at one instead of zero. Uh, and then uh, we'll, I'll just give it another new line and maybe some hyphens to make it look nice. All right, so we'll, we'll display the train and test split indices for each one. So first I'm gonna display the train indices. It's a new line, train, and another new line. And then I'm going to take train ind indis, uh, train idx, which is the train index for a certain uh, model, or, or I should say a certain split, and I'll turn that into a string. And so now for each split we can see the train indices. Now I also want to see the test, so I'm going to do the same thing, but for test, uh, this will be test, this will be test, and then I'll just add another uh, new line at the end. Alright, so uh, we can see now what this is doing. So for our first split, we take basically the first 33 examples, or 34 uh, examples. And all the rest of the data is used as the train set. Uh, for split two, we take the next 34 examples. 
uh, and all the rest of the data is used in the train set. For split three, we take the next 34 examples and all the rest of the data is used for the train set. And you get the idea. Each time we take the next little bit of the data and hold it out as the test set and then train on the rest. So now let's actually do that. So we've previewed what it looks like. Now let's actually train. So what I'll do is create a results array, uh, which is just, um, uh, it's just an empty list that I'm going to put the results from each model we train into into the list. So I'm going to iterate through like I did before. Uh, this time I don't need an indexer for the number of split. But I'll say for train index uh, test index in kf dot split uh, x train. So essentially for each set of train indices uh, and test indices, I'm now iterating through. Uh, we're going to create a train set. Uh, and this is basically going to go back into our data and use these indices to grab the examples we need. Uh, so we can actually use an index like this. For example, the most recent train index looks like this. Uh, if we want to use this in our data, we can take xtrain uh, and call iloc for index locator. Uh, and we'll use those as the rows and target all columns. And that will return just uh, the indices for our uh, for the train set that we specify. Then our test uh, looks like this. It's just these 33 rows. Uh, that is probably these ones right here. OK, so in here, I'm going to create a tuple that contains the train, the, the x train and the y train for a given train set. So our train set will be x train dot iloc targeting train index rows and all columns. And our y train will be y train dot iloc targeting train index examples. This is us one dimensional, so we don't specify all columns there. Then our test set is very similar. It's exactly the same thing, but we're changing this to indexing at test index and test index. So you'll notice we're actually taking all the all the stuff from the train set. So um, in, in practice, if, we, if we're going to go back and do this the right way, I wouldn't use the train set here. I'd use all the data uh, and then take out these little train and test sets from it uh, as we go. But just for uh, simplicity, I'm, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, keeping the tr I'm using the train set as to pretend that's all of our data. Um, OK, and then once we have this train and test set, we're going to create our model. And it'll always be a logistic regression model. Uh, and we'll fit the model to uh, train set sub zero, which is the x train, and train set sub one, which is the y train. And after that, we will get the model dot score to evaluate it on test set sub zero and test set sub one, x test and y test. And I'm going to uh, just append this result into results, so results.append the score. Uh, and then by the end of this, oh, test set is not defined. This should be called test set, sorry. OK. And then uh, at the end of this, results now contains all of the uh, accuracies for each model that we trained. So I'm going to do another for loop down here for i and result in uh, enumerates results. Then we'll print out the model number. So I'll do this as a formatted string. So we're going to put in the model number and the accuracy uh, to two decimal places with the percent sign. So dot format, passing in i plus 1 as the model number, and results sub, actually it's just called result, uh, result times 100. And now we can see uh, the, so, th so this is also accuracy. So let me print this out, actually. I'll say test set accuracies, or I'll say uh, k-fold accuracies. And is that how I did it earlier? Yeah, OK, I'll put a colon. All right, so you can see now uh, each of these um, has, yeah, so each one of these models was trained on a larger 
Well, it's not exactly larger. See, the the problem here is that I use the train set to to create the splits from. Like I said, in actuality, you wouldn't want to split the train set. You'd want to split the whole data set uh, so that you could see um, these values uh, about the whole data set, which is the same thing that the test set evaluation is trying to do. However, we're going to pretend that the train set here is our whole data set and say each of these shows a less accurate result, meaning it's less a, there's, le there's a very small test set for each of these. Each one of these is only 33 examples. But as a whole, you can see sort of how the model's doing without losing those test set, without taking that 30% out of the data. So this is like another way of seeing the value, uh, seeing how your model's performing. Uh, if you want to take it a step further, you could actually maybe take the mean of this. I have to turn it into a NumPy array first. NumPy array uh, dot mean. And then uh, maybe uh, print this out as uh, average at uh, k fold accuracy uh, and display this to two decimal places with a percent sign dot format times 100. Uh, one more parenthesis at the end. All right, and you can see uh, so this is the average accuracy across all these values, uh, which is looking very similar to, well, actually, it's a little higher uh, than this. But it's both ways gives you a rough idea of how your model is doing on unseen data. Um, and Kfold has a bunch of other uh, uses as well. You can use it for ensembling um, as well. Uh, but uh, this was just a way of uh, seeing how it can be used to evaluate the model. So uh, that will sum up today's video. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, and if you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content. And leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.